What's up everybody? Jacob here with Smetting Performance. This morning I want to show you guys how we balance our crankshafts on our Heinz Digital Balancer. This is going to be the first video of a multi-part series where we go super in-depth and break down every step and every process that it takes for us to build a 1,000 horsepower, naturally aspirated, 632 cubic inch big block Chevy. And in part one of this series is going to be me with you guys going over crankshaft balancing. So right here we have our crankshaft. This is one of our Smetting 4340 forged steel crankshafts. And because this engine is going to make so much power and it's going to have so much displacement and so much just going on, we have these crankshafts made with center counterweights. You see that on a lot of very high-end, high RPM race engines, but we are going to start introducing that technology into our street motors, starting with the 1,000 horse 632s. So, center counterweighted crankshafts evenly distribute the balance across the entire crank so that at really high RPM, the crankshaft doesn't start to bend and bow like this in the very center. If that makes sense. Like if the flywheel's down here and the harmonic balancer is at my watch, it'll bow in the middle at real high RPM. So center counterweights take care of that. That covers the crank. It's obviously going to be internally balanced. It has a 4.75 stroke with standard big block main and rod journals. So to help this engine make the power that it needs to make, it's going to be 13 to 1 compression and this customer is going to run it on VP C16 fuel. So, this piston, you might be thinking, how is that a 13 to 1 piston? Well, the cylinder heads we're running have a very small combustion chamber. I don't remember the exact spec off the top of my head, but it's very small. And because this engine has so much displacement, we actually only needed an 8cc dish right there in the intake valve to give us 13 to 1 compression. So, these pistons also have lateral gas ports, which Shay will give you guys more details on in his video, talking about the components of the engine. So anyways, really nice forge piston is going to give us great results and run very smooth in this engine. And it's just huge. I mean, I know I don't have the largest hands, but this piston is almost the size of my palm. It's a 4.6 bore. Just insane. And to connect the piston to our crankshaft, we're going to run our Smetting H-beam rods, of course. These are 4340 forged. These are our big block rods for our 632, so they're 6.7 inches long. Your normal LS stroker rod is 6.125, and these are 6.7. Just baffles the mind. And they're going to, of course, come with ARP hardware. Keep everything nice and in check. So, how do we balance a crankshaft? Well, first we have to calculate what's called the bob weight. And these are our bob weights. Their purpose is to simulate the connecting rods, pistons, piston rings, rod bearings, wrist pins, pin locks, everything that's going to be spinning on this crankshaft in the real world. So, we have what's called a bob weight formula. And we're going to weigh all of these components and come to a total. When we get that total, we simulate it with the bob weight. So whether it's you know 1,700 grams for a small block or if it's 2,200 grams for a big block, we make this guy, the bob, weigh that measurement. It's pretty simple. There's not much to this. So I'm going to start weighing these components and we'll start filling in this chart. At one point though, we're going to have to measure the small end of the rod against the big end of the rod. And we'll cover that in a second. Okay, so Let's start with our piston, get our scale booted up. So our piston weighs 603.8. Now I'm getting 0.7. Next we need our rings. So I have all of the engines piston rings here. We're running a Total Seal Advanced Profile Stainless Ring Pack. It has a 0.9 millimeter top, 0.9 millimeter second, 
and a two millimeter oil ring. And we're also going to include at this point the oil rail spacer, which gives the oil rings more support in this application. So now we have 30.1. Okay, put those away. Next we have our wrist pin, which is 188.6, 188.5. And then we have our locks next, which capture the connecting rod inside of the piston. 2.9. Okay. I'm going to skip the rod for a second and jump to the bearing, which is 100.2. And then we actually give it a little bit of an allowance to accommodate for the oil that's being slung up on the crankshaft. Generally, in like a dry sump small block, I'll factor in about four grams, and on a wet sump big block, excuse me, a wet sump big block, I'll give it six grams. It's really just a discretionary number to kind of put some effort into something. Some of these components in the engine are going to be what's called rotating, and some of them are just reciprocating. The piston, for example, and the piston rings, the wrist pin, the locks, the rings, they all go straight up and down in one motion. They're reciprocating. The rod bearing and the rod big end are rotating. And the rotating weights we double. So if you were paying attention, you saw me put four rod bearing shells on here for my weight. And I'm going to do a similar thing with the big end. We're going to find out the weight of this part of the rod. And we're going to double it because it's going to rotate in the engine. However, the small end of the rod, which is up in the piston, we're only going to use as reciprocating and use it one time. So to do that, first we'll get a total rod weight, which is 818.2. Now we need to find the small end weight of the rod and we'll use this little apparatus. And you hang the rod on here. And now you can see we have the small end hanging on this scale and we've got 250 and remember that's reciprocating so that only counts once and now we're going to subtract this weight from our total rod to calculate the big end so i had a total rod weight of 818.2 grams so 818.2 minus 250 568.2 for a single big end but remember that's rotating so we want to multiply it times two which gives me a total weight of 1136.4 now that we have all of our measurements weighed for our bob weight we can total this straight down and come up with our total bob weight so, starting from the top, 603.7 plus 30.1 plus 188.5 plus 2.9 plus 250 plus 1136.4 plus 100.2 plus 6. And we get a total bob weight of 2317.8. Grams. Now the hard part's over. Next, we're going to put all this away, get our bob weights out, and start adjusting them to equal that total bob. So currently, this guy, for example, is about 1800. So we need to add quite a bit of weight. I'm going to start the time lapse now and get these all situated. There we go, 2,317.7. And now I'm gonna do the same thing on the other three.
Now that we have our bob weights calculated, we're going to add them onto the crankshaft and give it a first spin to see where we need to remove material to get this crank to match our rotating assembly. Bob weights are all on the crankshaft. Everything's lined up. I've already zeroed this with a dial indicator on the crank so we get a very accurate measurement. And now we'll give her a spin. So it's going to spin up to a certain RPM. The machine's going to hold it there, take a measurement. And then it's going to spit out what's going on. All right. So you can see this is our front plane of the crank and this is the rear plane of the crank. So in the front, we have to remove a 108 grams and in the rear, 50 grams. And the machine actually tells you where to remove it. It's really, you know what, not that special. So you can see in the front here, we need to remove about 100 grams from this general area. And in the rear, if we spin it around, we need to remove 50 grams from about this general area. So. I'm gonna start in the front because it's double the rear. I'm gonna get it down to about 10, 15 grams, and that's gonna change the rear a little bit. Then I'm gonna to jump to the rear, get it down to about five grams, go back to the front, get it down to about two grams, back to the rear, and I'm gonna kinda of hop back and forth, bringing both of them down together, if that makes sense, and so they're both under one gram. That's my goal. We'll see if we can make it happen. In the front of the crank, we have so much weight to remove that I'm gonna split it between two different holes. So I've just made my first cut on the crank. Now we're gonna spin it back up, remeasure, and reevaluate where we need to be. So now we're down to 67, and see the rear's changed a little bit. That's why you always bring down the heavier before you go to the lighter. So, down to 67 grams, I'm gonna keep drilling into those two holes I just made and bring it down into the low teens. Okay, down to 39, let's keep drilling. Okay, the front is down to 13 grams. So now we're gonna jump back to the rear and bring it down to about five grams. Sometimes you gotta just give yourself a pat on the back. One shot, under four grams. Freaking awesome. I'm gonna jump to the front and bring it down to two now. Okay, I've done the last of my drilling. This should be the final, final spin. And there it is. We are under one gram front and rear. You know what, for the fun of it, let's do the math. So we're, the worst of these is 
So we got 0.88 times 100. Let's divide that by our initial bob weight of 2317.8. Whoops. 2317.8 equals 0 0.038, we'll call it. So 100 minus 0 0.038 means I have an accuracy of 99.962% perfect balance. That's better than Walter White numbers, people. Let's talk about some accuracy. A large part of that is due to the Heinz machine. This balancer is amazing. It may not look like it's brand new and all white, polished, stainless, but look at the numbers we're getting fairly quickly out of it. Isn't a sales pitch for Heinz? We own this machine. They don't even know we're doing this for them. But every crankshaft at Spedding Performance that we balance and every engine that we build gets balanced on this machine to this level of accuracy. Now, I'm gonna come back and deburr the edges of these holes that I've drilled because they're a little sharp. And Shay, our engine builder, has little baby soft hands. So I'm gonna get those deburred for him. And this crankshaft is now ready for assembly. And the next part of this video series, Shay is going to go over bearing clearances, ring gaps, the type of rings we're gonna use, the type of bearings we're gonna use, why we use those rings, why we use those bearings, etc. So drop a comment down below letting me know how excited you guys are to see part two of this series. And we'll see y'all there.